Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much uh, for your word that you've given to us. Thank you for the good news of our creation and salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for your love for us and him. And I do pray that each of us here today, you would give to us ears to hear your word, hearts open to receive your word and to believe. Lord, bless us. Give us eyes to see the glory of your Son, even as we reflect upon this wonderful creation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be looking again at uh, Genesis 1 and 2 today. Um, The sermon notes are in your bulletin if you wish to follow along there. Last fall, I mentioned in a sermon the the recent conversion of uh, a woman by the name of Ayan Hirsi Ali, if you remember that. For those that missed it, um, Ayan Hirsi Ali was a, is a w- brilliant, absolutely brilliant woman from, uh, she was born in Somalia and raised under the Muslim Brotherhood under great oppression. In 1992, she fled to the Netherlands and then after 9-11, uh, she completely renounced Islam, publicly renounced Islam and declared herself soon after uh, an atheist. And for the last 20 or more years, she has been going about as a very outspoken atheist. But then last November, she wrote an article entitled, Why I Am Now a Christian. And it's an excellent article. I encourage you to read it if you haven't. She has some wonderful insights. And in it, she reflects upon why she became a Christian. She was looking at the civilization that we live in particularly Western civilization and all the freedoms that we enjoy. Freedoms actually to be an atheist without being killed. How about that? And she says, but this civilization is under great threat today. And she identified three major sources of danger. One is from communist China and Putin's Russia as they're seeking to expand their empires. And then also the rise of global Islamism as we see in Israel with the Palestinians and Hamas and Iran and all these countries that are seeking to expand and take over. And then also uh, what she would call the the woke mind virus that is affecting our young people in the academies and the schools of the critical race theories that are being presented to our kids. And she says this, um, she realized that atheism is impotent completely powerless to counter these ideologies and to defend our freedoms, completely powerless. And the reason is because atheism, there is no greater meaning. There is no story that unifies us. And all, the, there's, all we have are these different theories, but they don't bring a powerful meaning. And she says this, quote, in her article, the lesson that I learned from my years with the Muslim Brotherhood was this. The power of a unifying story embedded in the foundational text of Islam to attract, engage, and mobilize the Muslim masses. Unless we offer something as meaningful, I fear the erosion of our civilization will continue. And fortunately, there is no need to look for some new age concoction of medication and mindfulness Christianity has it all. That was her conviction. She says, I saw the power of a story. As the, as the Muslim Brotherhood was taking the Islamic story and using that to mobilize, to attract, to engage, giving people a greater meaning to their lives. And she says, unless we can come up with something better than that, they will have the edge. They will take over. No question. But we don't have to look far, she says. Christianity has that, has a story. And she's absolutely right. Christianity has a story, and not just a story. It is the true and powerful unifying story, a story that can save the world. And that's exactly what the Bible is. When God reveals himself to us, he doesn't give us a manual of policies and procedures for us here. He doesn't even give us a constitution. He gives us a story, the story. That's what the Scriptures is. From beginning to end, it is the greatest and truest story ever told. I might argue it is the only true story that we have. And everything else gets its truth from this story. 
And so that's why it is my intent over the next six weeks, we're going to take a break from the Gospel of John. Uh, We'll come back. We'll come back to it. But for the next six weeks, uh, I want to go through the story with you. Because we're going to be starting this evening our Bible challenge, reading through the Bible in a year. And we'll be meeting tonight for that. But as a starter, I'd like to go through the story with you. And we're going to take six weeks because it's, it's a big book. It's going to take some time to get through it. So that's where we'll begin. And my hope is that through this, we will come away with a deeper understanding and conviction of what we already know, but really to go a little more deep with it and find a greater conviction of it, especially as we read on our own as we go through it together. And that we'll be able to not only know and love the story, but to tell it well to those who need to hear it. So let's start. Chapter 1, the beginning. And the purpose of the beginning of any story is really twofold. It's to introduce the characters to you, so you get to know them, who they are, so you know who you're rooting for, who you're concerned about. And second is to set the the setting, to set the stage for the drama that is about to unfold. And in Genesis 1 and 2, indeed, we are introduced to the two main characters that this story will revolve around. If you didn't get it, in Genesis 1, it is very clear that there are two, there are lots of creatures being created, but there are really only two that our focus is upon, and that is God and man. And by man, I mean Adam and everyone who comes from Adam, which is everyone. That's us too, including Eve. But it is a story about God and man, and so Just to be clear, when I speak of man, I mean all of humanity, everyone who comes from this one man. And so we'll start with these two basic questions. All right, who is this God? Who is this creator? What is he like? What do we learn about him in these first two chapters? And secondly, why did he make man? Who is man and what is his purpose? So we're going to start with the glory of God. I want to retell this beginning here. So in Genesis 1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says that the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So try to picture in your mind what this looks like here. So we have presented before us this darkness, and in the darkness, somewhere in there is this watery mass. It's formless. There's no form or shape to it, and it's completely empty, void of anything. And that's where we begin. And God begins in seven words, his work of creation. Day one, he says, let there be light. We now can see this mass before us. And then day two, he separates, he says, the waters. So he takes that watery mass and he separates it into the, the sky, uh, the waters above and the waters below, and he in that way creates the sky. And then day three, he takes the waters below and he separates that and brings forth the land. And from the land comes every flower and tree and fruit and all that the first signs of life come on day three. On day four, he looks at the black and the outer space and he fills it with lights, the sun and the moon and the stars, the sun to govern the day and the moon to govern the night. And on day five, he fills the sky with the birds and the seas with the fish and blesses them. On day six, he looks at the land and he creates there all the animals, everything that creeps and crawls and walks on the land, he brings forth now. And finally, his ultimate creation, he says, let's read that together on page 2, chapter 1, verse 26. On day 6, then God said, let us now make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. So, as we went through that first chapter, we realized a few things. That this God that is being created is, he is in the heavens, over and above all of his creation, 
observing everything, speaking, seeing, and then blessing it. He is above it all, and he is not creating like a cold and heartless dictator, like someone who's creating a machine of some kind. He is creating like, I don't know, like an almighty father. That's how I would imagine an almighty father to create. And I want you to see this. I want you to hear the word of God. We'll call him the father in chapter 1. First, if we come back and look at the days, when he, he speaks, and when he speaks, he speaks light and truth. The very first words out of his mouth are, let there be light. So that what we could not see before is brought into focus. Now all can see it. We now see the truth. And then every word he says is truth because it comes to pass. Everything God says happens. He is completely reliable in all that he says. There is no darkness in him. As John will say in his letter, God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. There is no deception. There is no betrayals. Everything is clear, and everything is light and truth when God speaks. That's the first thing we learn. He is the God of light and truth. The second, when he speaks, we notice something very interesting. Did you notice that he's constantly separating everything? He starts with, we're going to separate the light from the darkness. Day and night, we shall separate the two. Then we're going to separate the waters. So we have waters above and waters below. And then we'll separate the waters below so we have land and seas. And then we're going to separate even the lights in the sky. So we'll have the sun in the morning and the day and the moon by night. And then even when I create all the creatures, we are going to separate those two because he's going to create every one according to its kind. So there's clear distinctions and separations. And even when he comes to his greatest creation, the man, he again separates male and female. And so I would say it this way, that what we learn from this is that second, that this God of light and truth is also the God who ordains. He is the God of law and order. You can see that clearly. There are boundaries set. There's an order to everything. He is not the God of chaos and confusion. In fact, you you get a sense of that. You see, whenever there's evil, have you noticed that? There is confusion. There is a chaos. We don't even know what's what, what's good and evil, what even a man or a woman is. Everything is confused when the darkness descends. That's how it is in the darkness. It's a watery mass. Everything is mixed together. But God comes, and he not only brings light and truth, he brings law and order to his creation, bringing clear and distinct boundaries to all things. But then third, he blesses. He is constantly blessing his creation because he is the God of love and grace. Ponder the amazingness. He abounds in what he makes, in the goodness of it. He didn't have to create trillions of stars. That seems like a waste of effort there, many of which we will never see in our lives. He determines one star is not enough. We're going to have trillions of them. We're going to have galaxies of them. We're going to send them everywhere. Or even just the fish in the sea. There are creatures we haven't even discovered yet. The abounding in this. There's such a blessing and abounding in love and grace. And, And then he says at the end, which we read, he gives it all to the man and says, It's yours. All this food, all the food is yours. All the animals, even the fish in the sea are yours. It is all yours. It's an abounding in grace to the man, giving them dominion over the, all creation. So we're going to come back to these themes as we go through the story, but remember them. Everything started off evil and dark, darkness, emptiness, and no form, confusion. And the God who is light and law and love now comes and brings forth his creation from this. Well, that's chapter 1. Now, chapter 2 has a different feel to it, you may have noticed. First thing I noticed differently is he's not called God in chapter 2. Suddenly it changes in verse 5. It says, now it's the Lord God. And the Lord God is behaving in a different way than God in chapter 1. In chapter 1, God is above it all from the heavens, seeing and speaking from afar 
in chapter 2, the Lord God appears, and he's not way up there. He is right here on the earth. And he's not commanding things into existence. He's actually taking dust and dirt and making the animals. And he's the one who is planting the garden. He's the one who will take the rib from the man and make the woman. He's very physical. And so we see there's something different about this one. It seems like maybe there's a second God. Really? So we have the one God in chapter 1, but now it seems like there's the second God we call the Lord God appearing in chapter 2. And that's a mystery. We know that they're one, yet something's strange. Well, Mark read it this morning, and Colossians 1 explains it. That Jesus, the Son, is the invisible, he's the visible image of the invisible God. That by him all things were created by him and through him. So what we can say is, well, we seem to, it seems that God is a father in chapter 1. The way that he creates and the love that he does all these things. Could it be that he really is the father? And if he's going to be the father, then he must have a son. And that's what the New Testament tells us. That in chapter 2, we would say this is none other than the son of God that is at work now. And he's not the one who's speaking. He's the one who's working, who's doing all these things at the father's command. And he is not the God who is far above us and distant from us. He is the God who suddenly is with us on the earth. And we can see that first in his physical presence on earth. His physical presence. He is dealing, he's taking things, shaping them, forming them. And we're going to see that. As you read the story, you're going to notice this. Sometimes God seems to be so far away that you can't even look at him or you'll die. And then sometimes God is right there with us with the man, even wrestling with him through the night and in a physical form. And so we have this mystery. We have the visible God and the invisible God. And here we have it introduced to us in chapters 1 and 2 from the very beginning. And so we see first in his physical presence on earth, but then also second in his very personal concern for man. It is this, the Lord God, who says in chapter 2, verse 18, on page 3, the Lord God said, remember, God said, everything he said is, it is good, it is good, it is good. If you remember that, it is very good. But now in chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God says something a little different. He says, it is not good that the man should ha be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. The Lord God has a very personal concern for the man. He sees that he's been placed in the garden, that even though it's a, it's a beautiful garden and all the glories and wonders of creation are there, but he's alone in his humanity and he has no one to share this with. We know this to be true. It's like the, the joys of this life are so minimal when we are alone, if even present at all. I mean, just imagine the sadness of going to a paradise by yourself with no one to speak to, no one to interact. Suddenly, it's, it's hell. Even though all the glories are there, we need someone. We need another. And so, indeed, he creates out of his concern and sympathy for the man he creates him. If, if a man is going to be made in God's image, he cannot be alone because it seems that God himself is not alone, is he? The Father and the Son are there. Well, now we have a third person, too, that we have to mention that's introduced in the very first, well, the very second verse, and that is the Spirit. It says in chapter 1, verse 2, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we have this other third presence, this third person now, hovering over the waters, waiting for the Father to give his first command. And we find that that spirit appears in chapter 2 once again. So you know in the Hebrew, the word breath and spirits 
are the same word. And so when the Lord breathes into the man, that is the Spirit giving now life and breath to the man. And so that's we see the power of the Spirit now on display. He's the one who gives life and breath. We learn in Job 30, um, in, in the book of Job, he says that he gives life and breath to all creation, and especially the man as he breathes into him and makes that man into the image of God himself. So that's just, it's just in those two chapters we get glimpses, things that will be flushed out in much greater detail as we go forward. But for now, we get a sense of who this God is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even in the beginning. But now let's consider the purpose of man. Why? Why did he create the man? What does he want from the man? Where is this going? I think from the description of, cre- of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, it is obvious. God is not the taskmaster. He is not the slaveholder who intends to take this man and make him just serve him and build things for him as if he needed him to do. God can speak things into existence. He doesn't need some man to fumble something together for him. It's clear that there's nothing the man can do for him. So why does he create him then? Well, if he truly is the father, and it seems that he is, there is one singular motivation, and that is love. It is pure love that he does this. He is the father who lavishes his children with wonderful gifts. He intends to have sons. He intends to have a family, a created family for himself and for his son to enjoy and to give them the earth. He lavishes them with gifts. And so think about this, you fathers and parents. What do you want from your children? What's the very first thing you want as you lavish them with gifts, as you give them everything the home, their inheritance, all the presents every Christmas. You're breaking your back to provide for these miserable kids and you're giving them. What do you want from them? What do you want from them? How about this? Gratitude. That'd be a good start. And that's the very first thing. First and foremost, I would say, what God wants from the very beginning to the very end is faith, to live in faith. And faith means first to receive this creation with thanks and praise. God has given the man everything, everything, dominion over all the earth, all this glory, all these wonders that he sees is for him to enjoy. And even in chapter 2, God creates his own home there on earth in the Garden of Eden, which is on a mountain. All these rivers flow from it, and it's on this mountain top and this beautiful, luxurious garden. He tells them, even there, it's all yours. It's all yours. And the, the quick response is always, you give thanks and praise. Thank you. That's why it's so important for us to be here. This is our time to gather together to give God thanks and praise for every good and perfect gift from Him. That is the first thing the Father wants. And how angry does it make you when they don't? When they grab the gifts and run away from you or even sniff at them. How furious does that make? If they weren't your kid, you might be in prison right now. (laughs) To receive creation with thanks and praise. That's what the Father wants. And secondly, faith means also to trust and obey the Creator. Genesis 1 and 2, He gives commands that are not hard to understand, and they're actually not hard to obey either. What's His first command? Be fruitful and multiply. What a joyful command. Have a family. Get together. Have family. Have kids. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Take care of this incredible garden that I planted for you. I did all the hard work. It's all there for you. Now take care of it. Rejoice in it. Enjoy it. Trust me. But then he gives one more command that we saw in chapter 2. And he says, this is the only negative command he gives. In chapter 2. And he says in verse 16, the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So even as we, we don't even know where the story is going, but you know where it's going. They are going to eat, of course, from the tree. There wouldn't be a story if they didn't eat from the tree. But that's the first command. And the, 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 the concept is, trust me. This is the house of the Lord. The Garden of Eden is where the Lord will dwell with them. And he says, eat of all the trees you want. My house is your house. Just one tree is not for you. And you need to trust me. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whatever that might mean, it is not for you to know these things. At least not yet. Someday. But not yet. Trust me. It's, again, it's exactly how we are with our kids. Any generous parents, they don't have their kids stuck in one room. They say, the whole house is yours. The whole house is yours. The, you're hungry? There's the refrigerator. Help yourself. You know, there's the bathroom, there's the basement, there's the TV room, there's the living room. All these places are yours. It's all yours except for one room. There is one room you are not to enter unless we invite you in. That, of course, is our bedroom here. You are not to be. This is a space. It's part of the house, but it's not for you. And you have to trust us. And so it is. Of course, as you know, that's the one room the kids desperately want to go into. But that's how it is. It's, it's to trust and obey the Creator. It's not to figure everything out. It's not to have all the answers. It's not to build things. It is to work, to trust and obey, to give thanks and praise for all these things. And second, I would say what he wants from his man is to live in love. If the man is made in God's image, then he is intended to be like God, is he not? If he's made in his image, he is, he is to reflect God in some way, to know him, to be like truly his child, to be like his father who made him. And that means he must live in love and grace, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always. And again, notice his first command. What was his first command? Be fruitful, and multiply. To be fruitful and multiply. It's the one command the man cannot do alone. He needs a woman to do this. To be fruitful and multiply. The two must become one flesh and bring forth new life and have a family. It is the command to love. That his love would abound more and more and more and more would enjoy the grace and the goodness of God. And there's no end to this. There's no worries that you're going to exhaust the grace of God and the resources he's given to us. The man is commanded, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then when he creates the woman, he brings her to him for a very specific and special purpose. If you remember that, he says in chapter 2, verse 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So she is created to to help, to serve the man, to come alongside, to help him, to comfort him, to encourage him in this work, and to come alongside him. She, he, he makes her from his side, emphasizing this. She comes along his side. She's not someone to be controlled. She's not a slave, and she's not his overlord. She comes as a true partner with him to help him in this great work. And the man, when he receives the woman, look what he says in verse 23, the man said, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The very first love song. This is the first song ever recorded by man. As he rejoices in what's been given to her. And it says, Therefore the man is the one. He will leave his father and mother. He'll be united to his wife. Hold fast to her and they shall become one flesh. The beautiful picture as she comes along. He is now to help and to serve her too as he leaves to be joined to her, to become one flesh with her. And so we see this to live in love is for both of them in different ways to help and to serve one another. That's how this is to be. It's a beautiful picture. And notice how the chapter ends. The beginning ends with this phrase. In verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I can't think 
of a better description of the blessedness, the happiness, the freedom that you see in those simple words. They were both naked and not ashamed. Absolute freedom and joy. That's the beginning. Of course, now as I look at us today, we're far from that, aren't we? We are far from that. This story, even as I'm telling you the story, we're in the middle of the story, or maybe close to the end of the story. But it is going on, and clearly, how is it going to end? Well, this is where I want to conclude with this. The beginning of the story, and why pay close attention to it, not only introduces the characters, God and man, and their purpose, it also foreshadows the end of the story and the means to that end. Let me explain. Every story, every good story, satisfying stories. There are a lot of lousy stories out there. I don't care about those. Good, satisfying, true stories typically follow this pattern. They start here at point A, and they go, and they travel all over the place. They take you down dark paths and mountaintops and valleys, but they always end up at the same place but better. That's how it goes. We come around to the same place, but better. Usually the characters are much wiser and more mature and can appreciate what they have, but it always comes back to the same place. You, I can prove this to you. This is, this is how God designed it. it. In our music, anybody who knows music knows this or should know this that almost every single song that's ever been written, all the hymns in our hymnal, begin and end with the same chord. And when they don't, you feel it. It's so unsettling. I remember doing this one time with my son where I played the piano and I didn't play the last chord and he was ready to pull his hair out. It, just, it has to finish where it started. It has to. You've gone on this journey and we're coming back to the same place, but better. And that's what we're going to see when, when, if you were to skip ahead to see how the story ends, in Revelation 21 and 22, there's the Garden of Eden again, and the Tree of Life, but it's better, it's bigger, it's better, it's more glorious than we could ever have imagined. And this is just a shadow of what is coming. But we come back in the end. But also, the beginning of the story also foreshadows the means to that end, how we're going to get there. You, you'll see this in great mysteries and so forth. They'll have an opening scene, and they have a, a rule in, in, in writing stories. Is if there's a gun on the mantle, it, it needs to be fired at some point in that story. You're setting up all the pieces already. And in the Genesis 1 and 2, the means to that end are presented to us already, if we can see it. Because the same way that God created the man is going to be the way that he will restore the man and bring him back to the garden. How did he create the man? Well, it was God the Father in chapter 1 who spoke it, declared light out of darkness. He's the one who gave the commands, who ordered it, and it all came from his overflowing love as the Father for his creation. And that's exactly how his salvation will start with the love of God the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And the second part, that the Father, though he loves and ordains and commands it all, just as in creation, he doesn't do the physical work of it. That's his son, the Lord God, who does the physical work of this. He's the one who shapes and fills everything. And so it is in our salvation. The Father will not do the work. He will command it. It is the Son who will come in physical form. He'll come to earth again in physical form. And with compassion for the man seeing it is not good. I will do something. And with his own body, with his own flesh and blood, he will do the work of salvation, bearing the sins of the world as we will see and rising again in his body. And then finally, just as the Spirit was the one who breathed life 
and breath into the dust, into the man. So the Spirit must come again so that those who will be saved will be born again by a Spirit. He will breathe new life into us. So we can kind of see, even in creation, we can see the pattern being set and how it will flow. And so when we get there, it shouldn't be a shock and surprise to us. But that's the beginning. And that's just the first part of the story. There's a lot more to come. It will get very interesting in the coming weeks. But for now, let's get the first part right. We are not like the atheists who have no story, who claim that we have evolved from the slime by accident, by chance, by electrical pulses, chemicals, who knows where they came from, that there is no meaning to life, that we're just here and gone and forgotten and that's it, so just enjoy whatever you can, whatever your chemicals will enjoy, do. We're not that way. We know it. We know it. Even the atheists know it. Every one of us has been created in the image of God. Every one of us. From the least of us to the greatest of us, to those not yet born even. Created in the image of God with dignity and to be treated with respect and given dominion of this earth. Our lives have deep purpose and meaning and an eternal destiny. There's a lot at stake here. And most important, though, we are deeply loved, deeply loved by our gracious Father. And we have every reason to trust Him and obey Him and every reason to love and to serve one another. What a great beginning we have. So let's start reflecting upon these things and start by giving Him thanks and praise for all He's given to us. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the amazing creation you've given to us. Thank you so much for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for all that we have, all that we are, all that you've given to us. We, we marvel at this. Thank you for giving us one another as well. Thank you for the family of faith that we can enjoy you together. That we can come that we are not determined to be alone. Lord, we know even in the midst of this story there is still great sufferings, but yet even now we feel the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that too. Lord, bless us now. Increase our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.